Lepo pozdravljeni iz Kina Šiška. Hello to the online audience from Ljubljana. With tonight's discussion, Borderline Syndrome and Energies of Defense, we are starting the Igor Zabel Award 2020 program. At the same time, we are remembering the 20th anniversary of the European Biennial of Contemporary Art Manifesta 3, being hosted in Ljubljana in 2000. Igor Zabel, Slovenian art historian and curator, after whom the Igor Zabel Award holds its name, acted as its coordinator. And also our guest, um, curator Katrin Romberg, artist Sheila Kameric, and philosopher and sociologist Renata Selecel were involved in Manifesta 3, and with this also in reflection of its central theme, borderline syndrome and energies of defense. We invited them to look at this topic from the 20 years perspective, but also to look at it through the lens of today's realities, as it seems that the topic is gaining its relevance and also new aspects of understanding as the new walls or maybe wired fences are being erected across the Europe and its mental map, and also recently the COVID-19 pandemic challenges us with new questions and also strategies of defense and protection. My name is Urška Jurman. I will be moderating this event. I invite you to stay with us for an hour or so long discussion. The discussion will first include 10 to 15 minutes presentations by each of the speaker, and then moderated discussion follows. Um, you can join our discussion via comments or questions on Facebook or YouTube, and I will try to include them as much as possible with the help of my colleagues in the backstage. So first, I would like to share the screen with Katrin Rumberg. Katrin Rumberg is a curator and since 2014 chairwoman and artistic director of the Contact Collection in Vienna. She served also as a curator and head of exhibition office at Secession in Vienna and also she was a member of Manifesta 3 curatorial team. Uh, Katrin, um, I would like to give you the screen, but before that, I would just like to somehow introduce um, your presentation. The curators of Manifesta 3, Francesco Boname, Bonami, Ole Bowman, Maria Hlavajova, and you, Katrin, wanted to ground the contemporary art event in political reality, as you wrote. You decided to think about what defined contemporary Europe at that time through the perspective of borderline syndrome and defense energies. So please, Katrin, share with us your reasons for borrowing from the terminology of psychology for this title, and also how do you see your decision and its outcomes in a perspective of 20 years? So, Katrin, welcome. Hello, sorry. Hello. Um, thank you for inviting me. I have to admit, um, or I have to say that in the beginning, that uh, we were a collective. Um, we even spoke as, as curators. You mentioned already my colleagues, Maria Halavajova, Ole Bormann, and Francesco Bonami. We talked about working as a curatorial Rashomon, because we all four never worked together. It was the first occasion, Manifesto 3, that we had the uh, possibility to create a temporary collective um, for um, creating um, the third um, edition of the European um, a, a biennial um, called Manifesto. Um, and I have to say, you know, you mentioned also Igor Sabel. Igor was a member of the international board of uh, Manifesta, and he was our, our coordinator. And coordinator sounds not um, appropriate, I have to say, because Igor was much more. He was um, our intellectual and curatorial sparring partner. 
And I think, and I think my colleagues most probably will agree that we owe him a lot. I think the manifesto could, would have not been possible without his yeah, um, uh, wonderful personality, his knowledge, his in intellectual capacity to challenge us. So um, I'm very happy um, to also that you invited me because I had, I didn't look at the manifesto for a very, very long time. And now suddenly I had to dig in my past. And I remember these many beautiful um, moments also with Igo Sabel. Um, you mentioned also, Ulsha, that it's 20 years ago when um, the uh, manifesto in Ljubljana took place, so it was the year 2000. Um, but it's it, it's it's a, it's a real anniversary, of course. In Vienna, we celebrated this year also the anniversary of Christoph Schlingensief's project Foreigner Out. And also these two projects, the Manifesto 3 and um, Christoph Schlingenschief's project didn't know from each other. They were interconnected in their attempt to question art and resistance in the light of the social and economic structures. I just share with you um, an image of, of Schlingenschief's project. You see, this was, I only show one image. Uh, it was a very important um, uh, artistic uh, um, project um, for us in Vienna in the year 2000. So what I already said, that these two projects, the uh, Manifesto 3 and the Foreign Out Project by Schlingensief, were connected in the attempt to question art and resistance in the light of the political and economic structures in which they were embedded. Both projects took place during the hot summer of 2000, when the climate crisis was not yet an urgent matter in the public debate. Debates. Instead, the urgent matter was the new social and political realities arising from 1989 and the basic shifts occurring in artistic practice in the following years. Analyzing the new European realities in the end of the 1990s, when in the former West the war in Kosovo and in Chechnya the war as well took place and nationalism, racism, xenophobia became public topics in the former West um, countries. Again, there was for us no other way as to ground this contemporary art event in the present day realities. In the search of a socio-political matrix of the social and polit political outrages at that time, we decided to view these new realities through a prism of borderline syndrome, a term which we borrowed from psychology. I just show you here the cover of our um, book, which we published for the Manifesto 3, as well as the poster, which was um, shown in Ljubljana in the city in, on, many, on many spots. A source for this decision to, to, to work with this terminology, borderline syndrome, came also from our local ho host itself, the city of Ljubljana, and the position of Slovenia, historically never entirely in the empire of the European East, either geographically or mentally, but also never belonging to the West either. And the situation of Slovenia at that time was, a, there was a very si a similar situation also in European South and North. So everything was, was changing at that time dramatically. Other reasons which have brought us to think in terms of borderlining have been formed by the urgency to discuss critically the painful issues of new walls being raised here and there in Europe and on its mental map. Therefore, instead of delivering a diagnosis or providing answers, we pose simple questions such as why and where to draw the line. Today, two decades after Manifesto 3, these borderline structures still draw a restrictive line through the geography and mental image of Europe. And it seems that they are even more evident than in the year 2000. If we think about the recent defense mechanism translated into dangerous political forces legitimized by democratic consensus. And as Renata Saletzel might speak about these current borderline structures in greater depth, I will just mention briefly how this new social political reality after 1989 affected art in our curatorial work. In our statement for Manifesto 3, we outlined the question of protection in situation where the definition of borders at all level is being crossed, questioned and erased. 
We asked ourselves what is to be protected and which values are basic enough to activate the energies of defense. These issues of protection, which at first glance could be seen problematic, addressed among others also the new conditions in which art was embedded after 1989. We experienced, and specifically Maria and myself, experienced during our research for Manifesto 3, not only a strengthened and accelerated economization in Europe in all fields of society. We also experienced a confusion about art and what it means. It seemed that art was already part of an economic system that determines its understanding and that it became one of multiple practices that produced contradictional meanings for many of the stakeholders within the field. And not least, the expansion of biennials and other events of contemporary art indicated a global expansion of the system. If I remember correctly, we cur curators were aware that we cannot avoid this system. Quite in contrary, we, are, we were all part of it, including Manifesta. However, we asked ourselves, how can art sustain its position within the system where it's no longer granted that art itself represents a strong and autonomous value? What does it mean for art and the European Biennale of Contemporary Art in Ljubljana when it is part of the new dominant world order? Is contemporary art at all able to make the disparate realities of the present perceivable? And are there any signs that art maintain influence on society? And if so, what possible qualities inherent to it should be focused on? Yeah. I leave this image for a minute because uh, I just want to mention Sheila Kammerich's intervention into the public space of Ljubljana. Um, she, um, Sheila will go into greater detail of the, about, about this project, so I will not show you an image as Sheila anyhow will talk about it. But Sheila's intervention um, in, into the public space in Ljubljana is one of the projects at Manifesto 3 that re related concretely to these issues I was talking about. Sheila used art to make the paradoxes of the two-edged realities of shifting borders and politics of exclusion and defense in Europe at the end of the 1990s transparent. There is another project I would like to share with you, um, and I think um, maybe our friends in Ljubljana remember also this um, project, is the project of Markus Geiger. It's also an intervention into the public space. And as you can see, unfortunately, we, I do not have very good photos, but I, you can see on, the on this photo that Markus Geiger covered with pink pa paint the area between Zankariev Dome, the largest cultural set, um, uh, the, the largest Slovene cultural center. The Zankariev Dome was also our producer, uh, or the producer of the manifesto, and the Nova, Nova Ljubljanska Bank, which is in opposite of um, this cultural center. The, cul the colored surface linked these two powerful institutions. On the one hand, the organization of cultural production in Ljubljana, and on the other hand, the surveillance of one's life to capital um, uh, represented by the, by the bank. I think this is. I think this photo shows the bank. I'm not totally sure, but I think it's the it's the Ljubljanska bank. Um, both buildings look very similar. Um, the space in between, uh, suddenly, uh, with the painting this um, square in this uh, pink color, you can also say it's a, it's a mixture of white and red, and which is very some symbolic, of course, to mix these two colors after 89. Um, uh, uh, Markus Geiger unified um, these two buildings and suddenly um, loaded this square with many different connotations. Um, and he re I would say also that he revealed with it the relationship of, of art and economy in global capitalism. And finally, I will also like to share with you um, Pavel Altamer's uh, performance titled Motion Pictures. It was a performance which took place every day for 30 minutes in a busy and crowded square in, um, near the cultural market in Ljubljana. Famous actors, as well as amateurs, play, played ordinary roles, such as the old man 
feeding pigeons. You see this old man on the left side, um, or and then you see or a, a man in a, in blue um, shirt. He played a businessman. Um, then you saw young girls sitting on a wall, chatting with someone, and in front of them, a homeless person. All of them were either uh, uh, amateur, either amateurs or um, um, famous actors. Um, here, then there was a couple kissing in the midst of this place. There were, was a skateboarder you see in the background um, of the image. And um, what was also very important, there was a street musician playing music. And all of this, uh, this intervention of, um, of Pavel Althammer with these uh, actors and amateurs uh, suddenly changed the whole um, situation of this square, um, which is um, defined by a which is really defined by a kind of consumerist environment. So Althammer intervened with this performance in the real life situation of a uh, consumerist environment in order to make a mental shift in the everyday reality. Yeah, and here you see, uh, as a last image, you see this old man um, who started to feed pigeons and more and more pigeons came to this uh, um, square in the background. You see again the uh, street musician playing music. This project presented just a few examples of how art shown at Manifesto 3 addressed the complexity of the new social and political realities in Europe after the end of communism. All these projects stand for an art that did not elude our present and its reality, but produces it in order to unveil what the Austrian writer Ilse Eichinger called the real reality. While Manifesto 3 proposed to look at European new realities through the discussion of borderline syndrome and energies of defense by building a relationship between art and politics, Christoph Schlingensief produced in Vienna at the same time with his Foreign Out project a zone of disturbance, which mirrored the European reality of racism and xenophobia, but also our disorientation and the reluctance to take a stand with a social sculpture that activated the public differently than in Manifesta um, in Ljubljana. Um, yeah, this is more or less what I wanted um, at, at the beginning to say at, to, about um, Manifesto 3. I think, and what um, Ulrich, Ulrich, Ulrich already said, it's really interesting for me also to, be, to be a, become aware that um, our subject and also our approach to look at the European reality through the lens of borderline syndrome is still very... Um, uh, it, it, it's still an urgent issue which still addresses um, our reality and not only the reality in Euro Europe, I would say even in the meantime, a global real reality. So I think um, Manifesto 3 touched something um, and um, really are at the right moment um, uh, um, an issue um, which still, unfortunately, we have to say, we still, unfortunately, is, is a very relevant one. Thank you. Thank you, Katrin, uh, for this contextualizing input and also to share with us these two um, subtile art uh, works, um, which I have to say, um, in 2000, I was a young curator um, following Manifesta, and I, I have to say, I don't remember them. Um, so I'm very happy that you um, presented them to tonight. Um, the next speaker will be Sheila Kameric, an artist living and working between Sarajevo and Berlin. Um, with her artwork, uh, EU others, she participated at Manifesta 3, as Katrin Romberg already mentioned. Um, meanwhile, uh, she's also a jury member of this year uh, Igor Zabel edition. Uh, Sheila, I would like to ask you um, what was actually your personal and maybe also broader social, political or even cultural context for the work EU others um, and um, how would or does it fit into today's political reality and if you could also then in connection to this uh, maybe mention or connect it to your recent art projects, please. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm very happy and I was very excited when I received the invitation because talking about this particular work which I did called the EU Citizens and Others and participating in the Manifesta Tree Biennial was a very important for me as an experience as a young artist, but also it really much determined the, 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 the path that I took afterwards in, in my artistic practice. Uh, when I was invited to, to participate at Manifesta, I was a very young artist, but with a very turbulent past. I just, uh, it was the aftermath of the war in Bosnia, I, which I survived in the besieged city of Sarajevo. And as all survivors, I felt enthusiasm about living in peace. But that's when I learned that living in peace, it's not the same as living in freedom. And uh, what Katrin just talked uh, about this navigation to the, the political and social matrix, it was actually my reality. I was navigating to different political narratives uh, uh, that were happening at that time in Europe. And I also had to juggle and and how in, in answering the question about identities uh, or particular identities, I was asked the question which were very unpleasant, which I had to deal with. And they were focusing in a particularly asking of a young woman who just survived the war to identify as something that I didn't feel like. Um, so to to come back to 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 the invitation it came as a huge surprise because i was a young unexperienced artist and i was also uh the the to the topic came as uh, as a poke i had to react i got poked by it and i had i knew that i don't that I have to be very direct because I don't have a privilege to uh, to overthink it or to conceptualize my my work. What what also was was extremely uh, important to mention is the trust that I received by the curators of the manifesto. So as I said, I was very young and and this was my my actually third international uh, show, but uh, uh, the the big first big one exhibition first biennial that I participated ever. And I was uh, honored with the trust to propose a new project. So the, the team Borden Eye Syndrome was exactly my reality. You know, it was reflection of what I was experiencing. Uh, and that experience meant to live in a so-called normal life in which um, I, my reality of, 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 uh, uh, of basic human right to travel and to, 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 to cross borders was very limited. Uh, before the war, I was, uh, uh, as a child and a young teenager, I was very much influenced by the, the American culture or Western culture, which meant, in my case, the, the, cult, the music, the films, the, the, the art that came from the United States. So I always identified as a, as a European. And I had the privilege to travel a lot when I was a child. But all of a sudden, after the, the first shock, of course, was the, the, the war, but the, the war, you, you, you lived through the war in adrenaline of survival. But after the war, we had to face another reality and another struggle, which meant that we are not free to go wherever, wherever we want and to, to, to live this so-called normal life. Uh, we were restricted to stay in Boston because the, to getting the visas to travel to rest of the Europe uh, was extremely difficult. Uh, to travel to Ljubljana or to Slovenia was meant that I would have to queue for hours in the queue in, the, in front of the embassies of Slovenia 
or other European countries to get the, the visa so I can cross. And that, of course, meant also lots of bureaucratic uh, uh, issues and the problems and, and how to prove that the reason for your travel are valid. So uh, when I remember very, very, very uh, clearly the moment when I first uh, saw the signs on the border was when I was able to travel and when I saw the, the newly installed signs uh, at the border crossings saying EU citizens and others. I remember that moment because I recognized those signs, those light boxes as the symbols uh, of oppression that I'm feeling uh, and experiencing. But they were also uh, symbols uh, or two and tools of the great power that that comes uh, that, that 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 is political power and that constantly keep on oppressing people in a different ways but which are very subtle oppressions and which I believe that art can somehow uh, uh, focus or somehow point out. So uh, the borderline syndrome uh, was actual real thing for me. And, and I, I felt that I need to show it in the, in a very, very direct way. I would ask now uh, uh, also to, the, to answer the question of what it means in today world to show this work again. And it was interesting to, to follow through my career or this last 20 years, how this work was very, uh, very precise and very used in the many exhibitions in, in around 2000, but all of a sudden the, 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 somehow the focus fade out and it came back five years ago uh, when we, we, again saw the borders as a places of, of high uh, oppression and segregation when, when we saw the rise of Trumpism in the States and, and, and the, the walls and borders were again a hot, uh, a hot topic. But uh, for me as an artist, it was, it was really important to stay on this, uh, of this path of discussing the uh, imposed identities the identities which which are never uh, uh, a simple answer which always demand uh, uh, contextualizing uh, the, the the complexity that we live in different and uh, different identities and that we that we need to choose our identities by ourselves and not to be uh, uh, not to be imposed by the, these positions of power or these absolute positions of, pow of power. Uh, in the work Liberty, which I did in 2015, actually I, I showed exactly that. I showed what what how the freedom is very different from from the from uh, liberty and what does it mean to, to have this peace and how to protect it. So uh, so now we are seeing as uh, the the images of the works work which i did most recently which is again connected to very much to the work eu others because it is again on the border of the european union somehow it is installed in uh, istria which is in Croatia, and Croatia now became a new buffer zone to the European Union. So for me, it was uh, important again to reflect in a very direct way to the situation that we are facing right now, where the, the this shift of the border and strengthening the, the, the tools of oppression is, is again so visible. And... Um, I say that very often, I, I, I want to 
practice the art which 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 is very direct which is not the 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 decoration or entertainment but the corrective of the, of the society so uh, in the works eu citizens and others i did so 20 years ago but uh, um i'm i'm somehow uh, um, fulfilled that um i still have the power to to use art to 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 underline the the, the problems that we are facing and with the the work um a place to stay in in istria uh, i did did that confronting the ideas of mass tourism with the mass migration and uh, the the welcoming culture uh, of exclusive inclusiveness like countering these uh, uh, moments the climate change as well as the the other issues that we are facing or the place to stay versus the place to be in we, in which the, the the we are now constantly also uh shifting some people still uh are uh, still are uh struggling to get the freedom that others are taking uh, in uh, taking uh, so lightly so uh i guess that the 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 in a new normal so to say uh, art has uh, even bigger challenges to to face and to be used as a tool to help again navigate the 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 the, the complex political and social issues and be a uh, corrective to to us all thank you thank you Sheila for this um personal and engaged uh, presentation um and as a third speaker, um, I would like to present Renata Salitzel, who is with us in Kino Šiška in Ljubljana. Um, Renata Salitzel is a Slovenian philosopher, sociologist and legal theorist. She's a researcher at the Institute of Criminal criminology at the Ljubljana's Faculty of Law and holds a professorship at Birkbeck College in London. Um, in 2000, she also conceived a conference, um, Borderline Syndrome, as part of Manifesta 3 in Ljubljana. Uh, in her presentation, Renata Salitzel will focus on impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on individuals and society. Um, so please, Renata, tell us why did you decide to talk about this particular um, situation of a COVID-19 pandemic in relation to our topic of tonight's discussion? Thank you, Urška. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be back in the art circles. Um, yeah, I remember 20 years ago, uh, Igor Zabel coming to me and he asked me to organize a conference, a kind of an intellectual, theoretical reflection on the borderline syndrome. And he gave me sort of like a completely a free, you know, space and uh, it was completely up to me what I wanted to do and uh, happily I was able to invite uh, Frederick Jameson from Duke University, uh, Mark Cousins who unfortunately died a few weeks ago from London, Parvin Adams uh, also from London among others and uh, even Ariela Azulai, a filmmaker from Israel who is now in the United States. So we had a incredible conference, uh, like a theoretical reflection, what did borderline mean at that time and how to think borders sort of philosophically, artistically. And today I thought I wanted to think about the new borders. At first, of course, uh, we have to acknowledge we are dealing truly with a kind of a, an, a new border between us, sort of the, the humans, and you know the virus, which we don't even know whether it's uh, you know alive or dead, and which completely reshaped the world. So, at first, when we started dealing with pandemic, the theory was that we are all in the same boat, that in a kind of a, almost like a borderline 
borderless society, but very quickly it became clear that there are huge divides among those who can shelter in their homes and those who have to work. And, you know, those who live, uh, you know, kind of secured, economically secured lives and people. Which is why in my uh, last book, which I wrote in the Slovenian, I sort of like called it that a human is a virus to another human. Like uh, there is a social distancing which we are talking about, but, or even more physical distancing that is happening uh, among us, but also psychological distancing. So we have been experiencing now all kinds of feelings that are emerging among people. One I would call Corona envy. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, with the first lockdowns, we experienced a kind of a police state, which unfortunately we are still living in now in the second wave. And a lot of people became sort of like a kind of a policeman, police women in their spare time. Um, they were trying to, you know, establish who is uh, breaking the laws, who not. They were surveying each others. And there was this envy. Uh, there was a perception that others are enjoying uh, at the expense of those who are obeying orders. Now, in psychoanalysis, we know very well that uh, when we think that others are enjoying at our expense, you know, first we will not get an enjoyment if we get rid of these others, but, you know, second also that it, we, the enjoyment, that kind of jouissance uh, in French has been forever lost for us when we, when we became speaking beings. So quite often this logic of envy relies on the idea that we just hope that another person will not enjoy whatever we imagine that he or she is doing and that brings, you know, this kind of a jouissance, pleasure uh, to him or her. So the envy at first, you know, was related exactly to this kind of surveillance, especially surveillance of others. So we became like policemen of each other. Now, after we experienced, like I would say, like an inner border, a battle inside us where a lot of, uh, you know, aggression was sort of becoming more and more like a self-aggression. Uh, people started, you know, experiencing all kinds of traumas. Uh, people also started, you know, kind of uh, acting out in their uh, homes. Uh, a lot of domestic violence, which unfortunately is still going on. And sort of, kind of on the social, the question emerged also how to create a society where, you know, certain kind of an idea of unity and justice might prevail. So when I was looking at these examples, I started kind of rereading old Freud's texts and uh, I reread uh, Freud's uh, uh, group psychology and an the analysis of ego, uh, the mass psychology, where Freud is speaking actually uh, about a virus um, example when he is envisioning, you know, the idea of social justice to, through the question of how do people, you know, think about sort of like a social unity? Uh, how do people form like kind of a social justice in their groups? And he said that quite often the idea of social justice relies on uh, the perception that I will limit myself with the hopes that others with, will limit themselves too, or at least will not demand something, whatever, you know, I imagine they should not demand at that point. Now, when I limit myself and I hope that others will limit themselves to, you know, all kinds of other feelings emerge. And one feeling is sort of envy. Now, Freud speaks here about syphilis. So um, he imagines that people who are infected by syphilis 
might sort of envy others who are not infected. Uh, you know, they might actually unconsciously have feelings that they would like others to be infected too, so that they would be in some way on the same boat, if I use like today's metaphor uh, from the pandemic. But he said that actually quite often people rationally are, you know, kind of thinking that they don't want to infect others. So rationally people might think, I don't want to infect others, I'm trying to protect them. But behind this might be an unconscious feeling, I hope that everyone will be infected. So Freud's idea is that this, you know, rational theory, this rational, you know, explanation which we are presenting is quite often already a kind of a socialized perception, which means that, you know, people who have, you know, accepted certain ideas of communities, ideas of behavior, social justice, you know, rationalize something, but unconsciously have other types of feelings. So with the pandemics, all these feelings came uh, sort of to the forefront and we had new forms of aggression and also new forms of, you know, violence emerging. Uh, in the United States and elsewhere, people, you know, observed how people were trying to infect others intentionally. Uh, some people unfortunately died because of this kind of uh, COVID attacks. But there were also sort of like fictional you know, types of, you know, aggressions played out. So in China, a video film started circulating, which showed men spitting at each other. Now, the idea was that people were trying to infect each other with the new virus. However, soon it was established that it was an old film. Now, this kind of a spitting attack actually happened, but like a few years before. So, why do we need this kind of fantasies or even fake films to circulate in today's society? I think that here, you know, we can say that we are playing out through sharing such fake films, uh, the emotions in another sphere, since we are living more and more in the online world, you know, we can say that this kind of an online world is channel channeling our emotions in the way that, you know, sometimes it is hard for us to, you know, establish what is true and what isn't. However, it is interesting to see that sometimes people are sharing information online that they know that it is not true or that it is completely fake, but they get again out of a response. They get again when other people are angry or when their community is sort of happy that, you know, they are getting some kind of a response from others. In these challenging times, the question, of course, is whether these borders that we have erected today will stay. The even more important question is what will be, you know, the society of the future? Will there be a possibility for us to envision a different organization of society with fewer borders, with less of a social sort of a distancing and also, you know, with more social equality? Art, I hope, will survive these challenging times and probably there will be time for us to have, you know, another event to think, you know, the kind of the borderline syndrome of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Renata, for this really interesting uh, perspective. Um, we are... Um, now um, welcoming you to engage with uh, questions or comments on, on YouTube uh, stream connection. Um, I would have first a question for Sheila. I know, Sheila, that you are next week uh, planning uh, to visit a refuge uh, um, 
camp in a refugee camp in Bihać in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I would like to ask you what is um, the goal of uh, this trip of yours and also if you can share with us uh, the current situation regarding uh, refugees and migrants which are trapped uh, in your country, um, especially now before winter because as we could read in autumn, um, Bosnian authorities were also emptying UN-run uh, refugee camps in certain cities. So what is the specific situation in, in Bihaj that you are going there and what are your uh, plans, what are you working on? If you can share with us, please. Um, so the situation in Bosnia with the refugees is much, it's, it's much more, it's unimaginable. It's so difficult that, that it's hard to, to, hard not to react. And um, I'm doing the, something that, that, um, that it's a very simple action. I, I'm trying to get some aid to the camp. Uh, especially to the young children or the, the families with the children, and also trying to, to have a meeting with the authorities and uh, to allow me to um, uh, work with the, the, the workshop with the women in the camp. So it's, it's um, I hopefully it will be a successful uh, visit because there are people who need different, uh, um, different, um, Things not just uh, the, the 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 physical aid, but they also need the social contact because they are really kept in the in a in a very uh, closed environment of the camp where they can't have any interaction with the outside world, and uh, that's something that I'm trying to 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 uh, to work with that and and somehow help. So. It comes from 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 my from my need to be uh, engaged and 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 uh, not I, I as an artist or and as a human being I cannot um, just uh, stay silent and, and and watch that from the from my privileged position. So um, I hope I will be successful in in that. But uh, it's also something that that I that I feel very frustrated. Uh, all the time because uh, um, the, the news that comes from the, the European Union is uh, um, so uh, wrong and so unfair that somehow we also we as a, as an artist I say we we need to find the, the ways and the strategies how to also distribute uh, in information about what's happening and of course that's not something that I that that um, that I um, um, that, that I think that I'm the best at, but uh, you, to use all the tools that we have and to use all capable uh, opportunities to put in focus the, the such a big problem, it, I think it's, it's very, um, very important. Um, thank you. I would like to connect um, with uh, what you were saying now and what you are working now with what Renata Saletzel was talking before um, regarding Corona Envy. And uh, Renata, you were talking about the uh, enjoyment uh, getting through surveillance of the others or of the other. And um, I would like uh, to ask you if you connect or maybe if you could um, go further on in, in your interpretation, um, why actually this, it seems also certain enjoyment um, enhances so much in the case of the other when we talk about refugees or migrants. How do you see that, especially now also in the time of pandemic? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, we almost do not hear anymore what is happening in the camps that Sheila is talking about. We have been like so focused uh, on our own world, uh, our little, 
you know, world, of course, enclosed with our traumas, with our dead people, uh, with our political uh, fights. And it appears that in, in Corona times, uh, the wars really got, you know, sort of uh, higher. And um, our ignorance towards the issues, the social issues that, you know, Sheila mentions, it's unprecedented. And I think that, you know, of course, if we look in the, in the times, you know, previously, often, you know, the, you know, anger towards or refugees got, you know, escalated at times of illnesses, uh, especially, you know, even, you know, in the Middle Ages, they were blaming, you know, the outsiders or, you know, the enemies or whoever for, for the plague. So um, in, with this pandem pandemic, at first, of course, we had like the idea of the other uh, China, you know, being um, the, the guilty one. And then, you know, I, I think after what happened was a certain form kind of of, of pretty much blindness. Everyone is taking care of his or her own country. And uh, I think that this kind of things might actually get worse because I don't see any, you know, change in the near future, especially since we are, you know, entering now probably unprecedented economic crisis. Uh, we are sort of living on the edge of the economic crisis. So I fear that this perception that some people are simply discarded, which we see now also inside our countries in regard to the old, like especially people in, in the um, care homes um, and you know, with the refugees, as Sheila was talking, my fear is that those is issues will, you know, actually get worse. So, unfortunately, I'm very pessimistic. Okay, thank you, Renata. Um, I would like uh, still to go a little bit back to the Manifesta 3 um, hosted in, in Ljubljana. And I, I have a question for Katrin Romberg. Um, because at that time, uh, maybe still um, uh, in the beginning of 90s, when this European Biennial of Contemporary Art Manifesta was actually initiated in Netherlands, there was still a belief that uh, this kind of art and cultural event maybe had can also play certain role um, in sense of political and ideological building of a, let's say, new United Europe after the fall of the Berlin uh, Wall. Um, and um, uh, since Manifesta is a traveling Biennale and Manifesta 3 was actually for the first time organized on the territory of the former East, or at least um, on its border. And uh, Manifesta 3 curators wrote that um, your decision for the selected topic, borderline syndrome and energies of defense, and also, as you mentioned already, Katrin, were reinforced by the position of Ljubljana and Slovenia as a space between the former East and West. Um, so I would uh, like to ask you, Katrin, how do you remember um, the reactions of uh, a local um, uh, city or a hosting city or hosting country um, to the fact that you set um, a frame of the event that it's clinically, let's say, determined because um, in psychology, borderline syndrome means a personality disorder. No? Sheila already shared with us somehow um, her reaction on a personal level. She felt somehow challenged um, and, and, and addressed um, very personally um, on the level of uh, questions of identity and belonging. So, um, Katrin, can you uh, reflect on this with us a little mm -hmm. bit? Um, yes, with pleasure. I just want to um, maybe share with you a very interesting experience I made because we are all, I think, uh, at least Sheila and me, we're sitting in front of this uh, monitor, um, speaking with the monitor 
most probably people are, are listening to us. And, you know, I was thinking, uh, and Sheila and also um, Renate talking about refugees, but of course also about the virus situation. And I was just thinking about a discussion um, I listened to with, Is with Isolde Karim when she talked about the paradoxical space. You know, on the one hand, um, we, have a, um, we have the fortress Europe, so Europe is a fortress. And on the other hand, we, we have this open space, this borderless space of World Wide Web. Um, and um, these two spaces are existing uh, um, simultaneously. So it, now also for us, you know, we, it's, it, they are existing today and also simulta simultaneously. So, um, on, and, and at the same place even, if, um, you, if um, Sheila speaks, uh, I think, I don't know where Sheila is at the moment, if she's in, in Bosnia or in Croatia, but in Croatia you have um, all the, um, this, one of these um, refugees camps. So this is also this paradoxical situation we have still, we ha already had this paradoxical situation in, um, in the year 2000, but it's still um, existing. And this, it's a very sad um, um, experience, also sad that there is no positive um, developments in the last 20 years. Um, asking me about Slovenia and direction in Sweden is quite hard to, to answer it because I think the right person to answer it would have been Igor because he had to really face this discussion. This is how, um, you know, how the international art world function. Art curators are uh, working for um, a huge exhibition like Manifesta, ideally living in the city to, in order to research and to, um, um, uh, uh, um, to install the exhibition. But right after the opening, they are leaving and they are only coming for some talks or special uh, guided tours. And it was the same with us, I have to say, but it, it's not only that because we were busy, it was also that our, um, that the, um, uh, uh, financial situation was not so easy, for, was for us, at least for Maria Halavoyo and myself, quite difficult. Um, we didn't, we didn't have so much money for, also for researching and for staying in Ljubljana. So, so it's only what I remember is that there was a, a there was a, there, there, were, there were, uh, intense discussion in, in Ljubljana, um, about about um, manifesto. I think, if I remember correctly, I think there was a fear um, of the Slovenian scene um, um, that that they are too too fast and too directly um, connected with with the international uh, um, contemporary art world, and that they are losing its particular um, position in in Slovenia. I think this was one of the of one of the discussions. Um, another discussion was, of course, the financial discussion that money, public money, went into the exhibition, and there was the, also the fear that there is no money left for the alternative scene and so on. Um, so uh, it, it, uh, I think it's it, it, I, what, what was interesting for me also is I, I, I was more or less for two years in Ljubljana um, the, most of the time. I, I had a very similar experience in Austria, you know, a Slovenia, a small country, suddenly a small country um, uh, like Austria, which was, was once an empire and suddenly being a small um, country that you, that you so somehow um, felt overpowered by international uh, um, uh, point of views. I think this was also something with uh, what happened with Manifesto, that there was this fear and this um, um, criticism that um, the local scenes, and, and uh, which is a very strong and interesting scene, that loses its, its, its um, a sharp and maybe even dissident position within this new situation of contemporary art world, which is a, a global art world, as we as we know. So I think um, it was not easy for um, Ljubljana. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would also like to um, ask you, Renata, because uh, you were part of Manifesta 3 program and living in Ljubljana and following what was happening, if you could also maybe respond to this question of uh, host 
being a kind of a challenged um, uh, with uh, with uh, actually a request of um, somehow to um, become clear about its own identity and uh, with actually through the uh, clinical uh, metaphora um, how would you maybe more uh, as a sociologist and philosopher dealing also with psychoanalysis um, uh, reflect on this yeah I didn't have that uh, experience maybe I was a little bit detached from the sort of curatorial uh, team because I was mostly focusing on the conference which I was organizing which was like a huge challenge and yes we also had to deal with uh, financial limitations um, a lot of bureaucracy I remember because it was like a really really big event with a lot of speakers uh, a lot of media attention but no I I felt that Ljubljana was so interconnected with the world already theoretically before. Um, so the philosophical school in Ljubljana was very active, uh, everyone knew it. So the people, you know, very gladly uh, accepted the invitation. They just wanted to see how Ljubljana looks like. And because it was this big uh, exhibition, for all the speakers, it was you know, a pleasure to be part of the art world and to see the art, uh, to interact with artists. So my uh, experience was that Ljubljana was like a truly international, global city at that time when Manifesta happened. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the conference that you were uh, conceived. Um, and um, what was your focus uh, actually uh, within this conference and then also um, if you were um, to organize a conference today under the same title, what would be the focus of it today, maybe beside the pandemic that you were already talking tonight? Yeah, we were taking the term borderline uh, more metaphorically. Uh, we were speaking sort of like more the, about the idea of the border um, in sort of a philosophical term, uh, sort of like in the postmodern uh, theoretical uh, um, concept. And, uh, you know, a lot of writers uh, who were pre present there were of course connecting it with art but we didn't perceive borderline in you know sort of like psychological uh, perspective more thinking about the idea of border if i were to have the chance today um, i guess yeah i might very well take this term of of borders uh, precisely because we are dealing with new borders at the time of the pandemic and uh, i think it would be good to have a repeat uh, it would be lovely to invite some of the same people who are still alive for example frederick jameson uh, parvin adams uh, i think it, it would be a personal choice to have a repeat of that conference um thank you um I would have uh, maybe the last question for Katrin and Sheila. Um, I would start with Katrin, um, but it's also connected to what Sheila was talking um, about the relation between art and social political reality um, and how to navigate, as Sheila um, said. Um, you know, uh, Katrin, as a art manifestation, art event that um, said it grounded itself in a political reality um, already as um, Manifesta itself but also your edition Manifesta 3. Um, I would like to ask you how you uh, see today its borderline, you know, um, when it deals with uh, um, complex political issues. So how you see the borderline of an art manifestation as Manifesta or maybe in your case Manifesta 3 um, in addressing complex political issues? You know, the, the, I think it's a, a difficult question, but I think that we already experienced with the Manifesta 3 what I also mentioned, that, um, that we are already part of a system, of a new um, world order, you can see nowadays, we, at least uh, speaking from my um, personal um, point of view, I, I was not aware at that time that it's 
um, that we, we, we were working in the contemporary arts world, which, which is in the meantime defined as, as, a, as a system um, uh, um, which is connected, or even 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 it's, which is connected to neoliberalism and globalization. So th that time, we I, I we I had a vague idea that we 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 are in such a system, but it was not so. At least for me, it was not so clear. Now we know about it, and we know about the homogenizing. Um, um, uh, equal or issues uh, in this system, you know, that it's very, very hard and very, very difficult um, to, the, you know, to, 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 how to say that that, that an exhibition like um, Manifesta, which is a European biennial, we really can develop an urgency. Uh, um, I think. Um, in, with, I'm uh, looking back to the Manifesto 3, I'm very happy with, with the Manifesto because I think we were able, it was the last moment may, maybe, to be able to create really such an urgency also in, uh, in, the, in the relationship between art and politics. Um, so nowadays we have much that, that, that our, our art world expanded Globally, we have enormous amount of biennials and um, exhibition very similar, like uh, Manifesta. So um, it's, it became um, a challenging time also for artists and curators to um, to 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 to, uh, to, to be to, you know, to, to how to say to to um, uh, create uh, such an urgency, which is also discussed, perceived experienced and maybe which even have uh, the, the quality or, the, or the, the potential to shape reality. I think it became very, very difficult, but I still think it's possible. So I wouldn't say that it's not possible. It's still possible to create kind of counter um, projects um, uh, and, 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 and make urgencies um, um, accessible and, 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 and uh, perceivable. So I, I still believe in that, but I think it's much more difficult than it was end of the 90s. Um, um, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and also, Sheila, regarding your own artistic practice, um, if you could go on, um, um, actually, with what you were already mentioning, you know, to um, find, how do you find, what is important in, for you in your artistic approach um, in this relation between art and politics that also Catherine mentioned now, um, how you um, manage in, in this navigation uh, between uh, very intimate stories, uh, you work with people directly, um, with, with uh, uh, engaged commentary, um, with the art system and so on. So um, how, how, how you navigate? What is your approach? What is important for you personally in this, in this situation? It is, it is very interesting what Katrin was telling because I feel the same way. I feel, feel that, uh, that our uh, power to, to, to our power is weakened over the, the course of these 20 years. Uh, but I, same as Catherine, still believe that we can um, create this urgency and, 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 and talk about and point out the things which are taken out of the media stream and taken out of, of the public consideration. So um, if, if I, I, like we all, uh, have to uh, stimulate and motivate myself to, to, to navigate through this uh, um, very difficult times and to find again the tools to, to, to freely uh, do what I want to do. So somehow I, 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 I found that strength and that energy to fight back in, in, the, in the hope that through my artworks I can, uh, I can, I can point out, I can, I can fight back the, the positions of the power and the wealth that keeping us so separated, that are constantly raising those borders. And so, so I think that it's very, very 
necessary that we do what we can do because we although we are in such a difficult uh, time uh, we can also perceive it as a beginning of the new better world we, because in this moments of 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 great uh, uh, catastrophes uh, that we are facing not only with the pandemic but with uh, uh, a climate change and environmental catastrophe we really have to fight back for the values which are important for us to, to, to distribute the wealth to take care of the, the the environment that we live in and to to as I said like you know really use everything that we can because we are on this front line as a culture of workers as intellectuals we are on the front line to to uh, give back the power to the people to raise their voice and, and start thinking for themselves because uh, as we know, you know, like the, 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 our, as we, and we talked about it, the power was taken from us by this collective uh, and strategy of amnesia, which was directed through the different medias and, 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 and that we are constantly living, you know, this power is, is just taken out of our hands. And as I said, art, I believe that artists and, and the, 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 all of us in, in the culture, we have, we are as well in the front line to make people connected to, 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 to themselves, to the, to the reality in which they need to fight to defend the environment and so, whole, also, and so the humanity as well. Yeah, thank you. I would just like to ask you if you would still like to um, have some um, thought for the end that you maybe missed before, that it's important for you to still um, share with, with us, with others, um, that comes now, uh, pops up uh, into your mind. No. Then, um, yeah, even though not so encouraging, maybe, <laughs> conclusions, but uh, at the same time with the uh, uh, conviction to um, continue and not to stop in front of the new borders. Um, I would like to uh, say also that next year um, Igor Zabil Association, uh, together with partners in Ljubljana and Graz, uh, we will continue with our reflection on this topic of borderline syndrome also on the reflection on impacts of Manifesta 3 being hosted in Ljubljana. Um, I would like at the end also to invite you in the continuation of our program uh, next week, a uh, program of Igor Zabil Award um, uh, between um, 3rd and 4th December, we host a um, conference um, thinking about the universal, the meaning of universal today. Um, and on 4th of December, I invite you to join the award ceremony conversation with the award and grant recipients this year, uh, Zdenka Badovinac, Ivana Bagos, Laucho Dimitro, and Katalin Erdodi. Um, this evening was organized by Igor Zabil Association and Kino Shishka with the support of Erste Foundation. And I would like uh, to thank our guests, um, as well as audience, even though not so engaged. Um, and of course, also the wonderful team of Kino Shishka and Igor Zabil Award um, production. So thank you for tonight and hope you continue following our program next week, um, 3rd and 4th December, and be well.